position. I will present uh, some uh, some tools uh, that uh, I, I developed for sensitivity analysis and parameter estimation, mostly uh, machine learning tools. So uh, the main difference with uh, the talks uh, in the previous session is that uh, when I deal with data, for me, most of the time, there are data simulated with a model, not real data. And these data uh, may be also uh, costly uh, to, to simulate. OK, so uh, I first give uh, some few uh, examples uh, to explain uh, the, the framework and uh, which questions we want to answer. So here I take an example uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, wine, uh, of wine production. So uh, we, we had some complex model as uh, this model uh, was studying the, the hydric stress of, uh, of wine plots. And so we had a different uh, input of uh, this model. So some of these inputs were scalar. And they were uh, numerous. We had uh, 22 uh, scalar parameters, such as soil texture, rooting depth, vegetation size, and so on. But also in such applications, you have uh, important inputs, which are uh, weather data. And so they are temporal uh, and uh, spatiotemporal uh, inputs, such as the temperature over time and on different places, the rain, solar radiation, and the PET. And uh, one question was uh, which parameters have a great influence on the water stress because the water stress is what uh, people producing wine want to control. The second example is the one of the control of a channel, the water height in a channel. And here we have a control of the water height, which is a control loop. And this control loop takes as input some um, measurements and these measurements have error. And so we would like to know uh, the, which uh, measured data are influenced on the water height uh, to measure them more accurately. Okay, so there are typical questions uh, of uh, sensitivity analysis. So we have a model with a control or without control, and uh, we have some uncertainties on the input parameters, and we want to determine uh, which input parameters have a great influence on uh, some specific quantities of interest. So as I said, I most of the time, I don't really work with real data, the, but uh, we could also, F could be some observation uh, tool, but uh, in most of the time, uh, F is the computer experiment. And so uh, it takes uh, D input, for example, X1, XD, and it produces, it produces uh, Y, uh, a quantity of interest. And the model can be uh, time consuming. It means that to get only one evaluation of the model, maybe you have to wait uh, one week or one month. It depends on the application. And uh, the output may also be complex. They can be uh, space time dependent or over or more geometrical outputs. And so we, we want to know how the uncertainties and the input parameters propagate and the output. We want also to run the input parameters to know which ones are the more influent. And uh, if some of them are determined as very influent on the output, we want to focus on the estimation of these parameters. OK, so one tool to, uh, to do that is global sensitivity analysis. So what is the idea? The idea is that you will model the uncertainty and your input parameters by probability distribution. So that you have, a, so if, for example, I consider the, the simple case where each input is scalar, so I will model the uncertainty of the inputs by a, a probability of a vector in dimension D. Okay, so I have to determine the marginals of each xi, but also the copula if I assume that uh, these inputs are dependent. But uh, first, I will present uh, the case where the inputs are modeled by independent from the variables. So we consider that the uncertainty and the input parameters are independent from, from each other. And here, x minus j will just denote the d minus one dimensional vector where you remove the input j. So uh, 
Now we have to define some uh, some measure to measure the sensitivity of the output Y with respect to each input. And so for that, we have a measure based on variance. In fact, there are a lot of measures, but you can take this measure, which is called Sobel index. So you see that you consider uh, the expectation of uh, the output uh, conditionally to one input xj, and you take its variance. And you take the ratio with the variance explained by the full output. And if this ratio is close to one, it means that uh, uh, the input is very influent on the output. If it is equal to zero, it means that the input xj is decorrelated from the output y. Okay, and you can also measure the interaction effects. And here it is the total sub index. So you are looking at the uh, how you can approximate your output without the input xj. Okay, and if the total sub index is null, it means that you don't need xj to uh, approximate y. And so it means that uh, xj is not uh, an important variable. Okay, and the question is uh, how you can estimate such quantities because uh, uh, your model is expensive and uh, most of the time it is a black box. So you don't know the structure of your model. And so uh, you need a lot of uh, input output realizations in order to estimate these quantities. So you, you need to run your model on uh, many uh, set of values for the input parameters. Okay, and so there are many questions that uh, we have to, uh, to, to deal with. So uh, either you can uh, just use brute force and uh, developing uh, some high computing, uh, uh, high performance computing uh, tools. So for example, it was the case in this study. So here we were interested in a biogeochemical model and we had 74 in uncertain input parameters. So it's quite a lot and 20 quantities of interest. And so to estimate sensitivity measures, you see that you need a lot of uh, evaluation of your models. So uh, from a thousand to uh, one million. And here we used a grid deployment to do that. So the brute first, just Monte Carlo samples, but uh, on a grid deployment. And it is the kind of result you obtain. So here you see uh, a map where the dark uh, points correspond to interactions. So here you have the, the two order interactions, so between couple of parameters, and the black, uh, the, the dark points correspond to high uh, interaction terms. Uh, otherwise, you can uh, be uh, more sophisticated in the way uh, you, uh, you, you choose your samples. So you don't use uh, just Monte Carlo samples, but you will choose where you will uh, launch your model because uh, you can do that in some applications. You cannot uh, compute many times your model, but you can choose where you evaluate your model. And so you will use some specific structure design. So here, for example, you see a Latin hypercube sample. So you see here that you have only one point per uh, line and per column uh, in the subdivision of each uh, input. And the generalization of such design of experiments, uh, here, for example, this is an orthogonal array of strength two. That is, you want that your points are, um, are um, distributed in order to have good uh, projections on the two-dimensional faces of the unit hypercube. Okay, and if you work uh, hard on uh, these design of, designs of experiment, you can drastically reduce the cost to estimate sensitivity measures. So it is another tool we use a lot, uh, that is design of experiments. So I go a little bit uh, quick on that. So uh, yes, the other thing we want to know is uh, to guarantee the precision of the estimation of, of the sensitivity measures. And for that, uh, we want also to enrich the design of experiments adapti adaptively. We want to stop the experiments when you see that your uh, sensitivity measure is well estimated. And for that, uh, what do we need? We need uh, some iterative estimation procedure. And associated to this iterative estimation procedure, we need uh, nested uh, designs of experiments. So we want to build nested Latin hypercube sampling, for example, or nested orthogonal arrays. 
uh, and uh, it is another way to reduce the cost to measure the sensitivity. Okay. And then uh, once you have done all this, uh, and another tool which is very important is to reduce the model. So to meta model or to use a surrogate, there are different terminologies and you can work on model order reduction. And so uh, you have different tools that, uh, that you can use. You can work with a black box model. That is, you, you don't uh, go into the box defining your model. And for example, it is what you do when you do creating or Gaussian process regression. Or uh, you can uh, work uh, on the structure of your model. So if you have some PDEs or SDEs, for example, you can use reduced spaces or uh, uh, stochastic collocations methods to do that. So it is another important direction uh, for sensitivity analysis, or uh, more generally for uncertainty propagation. And uh, for example, uh, uh, we uh, we try to do that uh, at the moment to um, uh, uh, on a neurosciences application uh, that are defined by uh, systems of SDEs, or also uh, for the COVID pandemic uh, with compartmental models. How to construct a reduced model to make some forecasts. You can also reduce the dimension of any parameter. So in that case, what you want to do, so you have the model and it is defined on uh, RD, so D is very high, and you want to, in fact, uh, determine the main directions uh, which are important with respect to your quantity of interest. So it's kind of ge generalization of PCA, but where you take into account the output of interest. Okay, and so uh, more recently, uh, I I developed with colleagues some methods uh, using the gradients of your model. So if you can derive some uh, gradients of your model, you get uh, more information and you can use this information to be uh, more accurate in uh, reducing the dimension. Okay, and to conclude, the last, uh, the last thing I wanted to present is robustness uh, to, um, to irreducible uncertainties. So in some applications, you have two kinds of parameters, input parameters, you have control parameters, you can design these parameters, but you have also uh, parameters that you cannot control, such as, for example, meteorological parameters, uh, and, uh, and you want to be robust with respect to these parameters. So to be robust, for example, is to be robust uh, by modeling the, these parameters by uncertain, by, by random variable, and uh, considering that you want to be robust with respect to the mean or the variance or other uh, average quantities. And uh, for, for that, uh, I worked on different applications where this problem are important, but in fact, very important for, for all the applications, I think. So uh, in one case, it was automatic depolution. So in that case, you, the uncontrolled uncertain parameter was the driving cycles. So we want to be robust with respect to the driving cycles. And uh, in the other application, uh, the, we are interested in uh, designing floating wind turbine. And here, for example, U uh, is the ocean swell that you cannot control and you want to be robust with respect to, to uh, this uh, input. Okay, so I think uh, it's time to, to stop. <laughs> Thank you very much, Clementine, for, for the nice talk. Uh, other questions? I, I have one, otherwise. <laughs> uh, 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 yeah. Or in the audience? I do maybe? have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I know it's, it's not the main uh, subject of your talk, but um, are there uh, theoretical results that allow you to uh, compute confidence intervals for um, the estimates of uh, sobol indices? Yes, uh, we can derive, um, for, for most of the estimator, we can derive central limit theorem okay. uh, so that we get confidence interval. Or also you can do bootstrap, but uh, you can also get uh, asymptotic confidence intervals. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Vittorio, for the question. And, and maybe I will make a short question. Is, is, um, so you have some like a systematic approach to to detect the, the importance of variables in in the in, in a model and, and, and my question is motivated from the data science data driven sciences point of view 
that should be something that is useful to, to detect models, actually. If you, if you are observing some phenomena with lots of, of variables and you're able to, to tell which are the, the ones that are influencing. So, of course, this is something that we know from PCA for to say something, but, but this looks like something much more uh, precise in a way. So do you think this can be implemented in a more systematic way to, to deal with large uh, data sets uh, or, or is it still not too easy to implement? I guess it's complex to implement. Yes, it is the issues we are looking at. So if you are in a setting where the dimension is very high, you, you have to think about, uh, for example, uh, dimension reduction. Mm -hmm. or uh, approximation of, uh, of your model in a, in a high dimensional setting. So, and, and then you, what you do is that you measure the sensitivity and uh, your reduced model. And you have to measure the gap between the sensitivity measure and the, the one of the true model. And is it expensive? I mean, if you, have, if you don't have a guess of the important variables, uh, this, would, this would be expensive to, to implement, I mean, for, for without, without knowing where to explore. Yes, yes. The, the brute force is expensive. So it is what I explained at the beginning. So it is why we, we can work in several directions. So either you work in the direction where you, you choose uh, on which set of values you will evaluate your model. So it is uh, the, the research direction on the designs of experiments. Uh, you can also work on meta modeling. So it's more on model order reduction or dimension reduction. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, uh, of course, uh, if you just use brute Monte Carlo and you are in high, very high dimension, uh, uh, it is very really costly to explore your, what happens for your model. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Clementine. Uh, I remind everybody that you can still make questions uh, through the chat after the talk is finished, and now we will go to our next speaker, uh, who is Carlos Singlong from Catholic University. Uh, Carlos, are you, okay, there. Yeah. <laughs> so Carlos uh, is, is member of the Mathematical and Computational Engineering uh, Institute, and also of the Biolo Biology and Medical Engineering uh, Institute of uh, Catholic University, and he's going to speak about random artifacts and their potential effects in medical image. Thank uh, you, Carlos. Yeah. So yeah, th thanks a lot for the invitation to talk for this very interesting morning and, and workshop. And just a small detail, I'm going to talk about um, ongoing work on this, this idea, this project about random artifacts and their potential effects in medical image classification. So let me start by mentioning that, um, well, machine learning techniques and artificial uh, artificial intelligence techniques have, been, have attracted a lot of uh, attention from the medical imaging community because they have the potential to really re revolutionize and have a very large impact into um, uh, assisting medical diagnosis. So for instance, here we have uh, a very, uh, by now well-known example where you can use uh, deep neural nets to leverage large amounts of data to do mm -hmm. feature extraction that would allow you to associate from breast images, um, some sort of score or risk score that would allow you to determine if, for instance, one patient is very likely to develop cancer or these sort of lesions are just benign. And as you can see here, uh, the neural net sort of focuses on very small features of these images to try to assign a, uh, a score based on some, some kind of, of image feature. And based on that, you can sort of determine a, a prognosis. And one of the, the advantages of these kinds of techniques in comparison to the ones that we have now is that these kinds of techniques would leverage data and large amounts of, of images instead of just using the, the knowledge that some clinicians may have and some, some kind of service that you can have uh, with, within the population at risk. Now, one of the issues that we have, I mean, however, one of the issues that we may have when we think about convolution neural nets uh, for image classification, especially in the medical imaging context and clinical diagnosis, is the fact that deep neural networks may learn artifacts. So for instance, these are images from a study made by Czech and others in 2018, where what you have is a large amount of, of in this case, chest radiographs. And what you're trying to do is to, to determine whether you can diagnose uh, pneumonia from these chest radiographs. And the problem is that in this case, you have um, um, unbalanced data sets. So for instance, you have a lot of images from a hospital that receives naturally more patients with the condition. And so in this case, um, the authors detect that the neural net, what, what it might be learning is that instead of learning uh, clinical features, uh, as, as you would expect from the chest, it's trying to determine certain artifacts uh, arising from different acquisition protocols in each one of these hospitals. So it, it, what might be happening is that behind this, this method, what you're really doing is learning artifacts that act as surrogate for 
uh, the, the physiology or some kind of underlying anatomical uh, explanation for, for the disease or the risk. And the other thing that we know is that deep neural nets might be sensitive to perturbations. So to the left, we have a very uh, also uh, well-known example where the authors, what they do is to 3D print a turtle that has a very, very um, uh, subtle perturbation in the colors that it has on its shell. And they 3D printed this turtle in order to make the an image classifier to always classify this turtle as um, a rifle. And so this shows that you, if you, you can have very subtle perturbations on an image that may um, sort of throw the predictions of these methods awry completely. And on the left, you have uh, something that, that is, wasn't published on scientific papers, but it's something that, that uh, made it around on Twitter. Uh, where you see that uh, a Tesla, um, which purportedly has self-driving capabilities, confusing the moon in the horizon for a uh, traffic light. And so in this case, we see that the perturbation is not subtle at all. It's just confusing the moon for a traffic light, and that's obviously a problem. Now, why is that a problem in the context of medical image uh, classification? Well, it's because um, more and more medical images, particularly magnetic resonance imaging, the images are not being just acquired from the patient, but are being reconstructed. And the reason for that is that um, magnetic resonance uh, machines, what they do is they don't acquire the information uh, of the image on the right, for example, pixel by pixel. What they do is to measure Fourier coefficients of um, the protonic density in uh, the, the human body, uh, the protonic density of, of uh, hydrogen or the concentration of water. And the process of acquiring each one of the values of the Fourier coefficient is very, very expensive. And so that is a problem because if you have the patient too long on a magnetic resonator, the patient is going to move and that's going to decrease the signal to noise ratio. And that obviously degrades the image quality. So one of the techniques that has been very popular recently is uh, this idea that we may be able to reconstruct an image of equivalent uh, uh, clinical diagnosis quality from under sample data. And so in that case, instead of measuring every single one of the Fourier coefficients, what you do is you design acquisition sequences that, that just acquire the most important um, Fourier coefficients, for instance, more low frequencies instead of, of high frequencies. And then we leverage the structure of the image, which is, for example, that uh, medical images tend to be sparse in a very specific domain, such as a wavelet domain, shearlet domain, or curvelet domain. And so um, what you would have uh, now sort of formulating a very simple mathematical model, what you would have in the, uh, in the traditional case, um, when you have a fully sampled um, uh, image or when you have fully sampled data, then what you have is data that is or corresponds to the Fourier transform of the image that they want to form. So in that case, you just take the inverse Fourier transform. But now we're talking about uh, reconstruction techniques. And one of the most popular ones is, is compressed sensing, um, which was proposed in, in almost 15 years ago. And in that case, you are only acquiring a certain number of Fourier coefficients. And in order to reconstruct the image, what you try to do is to find the image that minimizes a certain criteria, for instance, sparsity in the wavelet domain, subject to certain data consistency constraints. So for instance, here, if we assume that our data has a certain level of noise, then we want, of course, our predicted data to be close to the measured data. Uh, now, one of, why, is this in, why is this relevant? Uh, why is the fact that we are reconstructing images relevant for medical image classification? It's because image reconstruction techniques introduce artifacts. So here you have, uh, for instance, a clinical evaluation uh, from, a, well, that was done by a group uh, published later by Sartorelli et al. in 2018, where you see that even though you are reconstructing images at a very high quality, you may still have some, some artifacts like the ones shown here in, uh, with, the, with the white R arrow that are not part of the structures that you have in the brain, for instance. So here you have very strange oscillations in the brain that are not part of the physiology of the brain. And the question is whether these artifacts maybe could act as perturbations that lead to misclassification in these uh, sort of convolutional neural networks classifiers. And the other thing is that um, reconstruction techniques not only introduce artifacts, but they also change the statistics of the measurement noise compared to the fully sampled case. And what, what, do, we, what do we mean by that? Uh, if you had a fully sampled uh, data set, then you know that the data is just the Fourier coefficients of the image that you want to, uh, to acquire, plus some additive Gaussian noise. Uh, this is the standard model that's used in, in practice. And so in the fully sampled case, if you just take the inverse Fourier transform, then you're going to see the real image or the true image also corrupted by additive Gaussian noise. And this is because the Fourier transform is a unitary transform. And so in that case, you see that if we were to able to acquire several times the data from the same image under this model, 
And then you take the average reconstruction and you look at the individual's reconstructions and the error that they have, then you would see that the error, as you see in this slide, is very homogeneous. It's just Gaussian. So in this case, we would expect that these sort of perturbations could not act as something adversarial for image classification because they tend to be homogeneous and random. However, if we look at the undersample case, then our estimate is no longer just a linear transform of the data, but instead is uh, some sort of, um, of a very complex function that we are evaluating here. Uh, I'm going to skip some of the technical details. Let's, let's assume that the minimizer is unique, so you have a function of the data. And so in this case, uh, you, you are not, this is obviously going to change the statistics of the noise because you are extrapolating the data in a few coefficients to all the pixels in the image. And that necessarily is going to introduce actual dependencies in the values of two different pixels. And that obviously introduced certain spatial structure. And using this very simple decomposition, you see then that our estimate is equal to the true image that we want to reconstruct plus two effects. The first effect is the bias, uh, which you could uh, we model as this, this sort of um, deterministic structures or artifacts that you impose or you're observing superimposed on the, on the image, plus some random effect. And the question, or one of the questions that we're focusing right now is trying to understand what are the statistics of these fluctuations, these random effects. So going back to the, the examples that I show you, if you do the same thing now, um, so you, you take the same image, you undersample the Fourier coefficients, you add noise and then reconstruct, then like we, say, we saw previously, uh, the reconstructions are quite good. Um, they all look almost the same to the naked eye. But if you look at the stochastic perturbations between each uh, one of them, and you look, for instance, to the variance, um, you see that now you start seeing some, some sort of artifacts. And in fact, you see that the variance of the, of the perturbations in each one of the voxels tends to be higher in the parts where the, the image has discontinuity. So in this case, it would be near the boundary of the, of the cranium. Uh, so Effectively, what we are saying is that when you reconstruct images, the, there, there is some sort of stochastic uh, uh, artifact that's showing up on the reconstructed, or on the true image. And the question is whether these, uh, these uh, patterns that are now structured or have a little bit of structure could act as an adversarial perturbation to these um, uh, image classification techniques. Now, one of the things that we, ha we have done here, uh, also I, I'm going to skip some of the um, uh, of the technical details, the mathematical details. But of course, you could ask yourself is whether this is a subtle effect. Uh, what, are the, uh, what are the parameters of the reconstruction technique that leads to this sort of spatial correlations? And one of the things that we can do um, and, and we can analyze uh, with, with analytical, analytical tools is the so-called noiseless limit, uh, which means that uh, what we're interested in is in understanding what happens with this um, random patterns. Um, as the noise tends oh, is very low, uh, which is also in many cases very close to medical practice. And if you were to assume, uh, for instance, that the reconstructed image is, um, is regular, in this case, differentiable um, near the noiseless data, uh, then you could show that in the noiseless limit, you should observe a correlation uh, or a covariance matrix that's not diagonal. And in fact, you would see that this covariance matrix is not only uh, non-diagonal, non but it's also low rank. And from this, or this is our point of departure for justifying that even in the case of, um, of very low noise, you would expect to see some sort of um, spatial uh, pattern coming from the noise that could be characterized if you are able to characterize quite well the reconstruction uh, method. Now, of course, in practice, it's impossible to evaluate this, this in closed form. I, I just have two, one minute left, so I'll, I'll be, I think, in time. But in, in practice, of course, it's impossible to evaluate this in closed form, except in very, very simple cases. And it, it's particularly difficult if you are doing something else on top of just computing the images. So for instance, there's a technique that's called 4D flow. Uh, that, and, and what that technique does is acquire four complex images, and then from there, uh, estimate a velocity field. And from doing that, you can sort of resolve the velocity field in the heart, in this case, during a cardiac cycle, like you see in this video. So in this case, you, you have these random patterns on the image, and you are applying a nonlinear transform. So of course, it's going to make the, the, uh, the analysis of these random patterns much, much harder. And in that case, uh, well, these are preliminary results that show you that, that in, in fact, we do have these, these sort of spatial correlations. Um, but just uh, let me um, finish. And so. In this case, obviously, we have to leverage computational techniques to estimate the covariance or summary statistics numerically. 
Um, or we could try to somehow fit the random distribution of the noise using techniques as normalizing flows or Gaussian process, process regression, maybe. Um, and also, we would be interested in, in trying to understand how this term depends on the true image or how independent it might be from uh, the true image. So as a conclusion, uh, the reconstruction techniques introduce deterministic and random artifacts that could lead or could act as adversarial perturbations to image classification methods. Uh, this is as an, an effect that we would like to study. We know that a correlation structure should appear in the noiseless limit, as, as I, I showed. Um, also for finite noise variance, then we cannot leverage um, really close uh, or analytical te techniques are a bit harder to, to leverage in that case to analyze the problem. So we have to leverage computational techniques. And the other thing that's important is that is the question whether this effect should be accounted for data curation. So that means that when you're trying to make a data, um, a data set balanced, you should also account not only for certain artifacts, like say the instance of the name of the hospital, but also things like reconstruction protocols for the images. So with that, um, I thank you for your attention and I would be happy to answer any questions uh, you, you may have. Thank you very much, Carlos. Very interesting talk. Uh, are there questions? Eduardo? Eduardo has one. Eduardo uh, yeah. yeah. Hi, Carlos. Thank you for, for, the, for the nice presentation. Uh, three slides ago, you show a, a kind of simulation, a flow, no? Yeah, there. This Is one? that uh, just a reconstruction or there are uh, the physical equation inside? Ah. No, this is this is acquired by the the MR machine. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So so this is this is measured data. Okay. So that, that was my, my question was that in your development do you do you incorporate also the equations uh, just to 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 do some data driven science mixed with classic science classic method in, in, in to study that kind of flow? Okay, yeah, that's that's a great question because um, you could you could think of so I mean yes. So when you reconstruct the images and you obtain like an estimate of the flow like you see here, maybe this flow is non-physical. Uh, because maybe it doesn't satisfy, say, the average stock equation to, to a certain degree. And so one of the things that we would also like to explore that I didn't focus on the, on this talk is how do you can leverage the navier stokes equations in this case to denoise the data and actually try mm -hmm. to find the physical flow that's, that's closest to the one that you measure. Um, so, so that's another thing that, that we are interested in, but um, I, I didn't focus on, on that, that part. Okay, thank you, Carlos, very nice. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Carlos. Uh, so I think we can go to our next uh, presentation. And uh, so now our next speaker is Jerome Bolt. Are, are you there, Jerome? Can you start sharing? Uh, okay, let me do that. Okay, so in the meanwhile, I, I, I introduced Jerome Bolt from uh, University Toulouse Capitol. And uh, he's member of the Artificial and Natural Intelligence Institute of Toulouse and ch uh, charge of the chair large scale and optimization AI. AI. <laughs> uh, please, Jerome. And Jerome is going to speak about non smooth automatic differentiation. Okay, thank you, uh, Joaquim. So, um, I hope you hear me well. I have problem with my internet. Um, okay, so. Um, I'm going to, to, to try indeed to, to speak about uh, non-smooth automatic uh, differentiation. Uh, and I hope my, my um, presentation will not be too easy. I uh, didn't realize what was the, the audience. Anyway, so, um, so I am interested in neural networks. So I'm going to recall a few things about uh, these networks and, and show uh, how uh, this automatic uh, differentiation comes uh, into play. Uh, so we have a, a series of uh, labeled data, xi, yi, and we wish to find a prediction function f that predicts uh, yi from xi for all i. Okay, typical example is uh, animal pictures and uh, for xi and yi, the name of the animal. Uh, as uh, most of you know, I'm going to look for these predictors in a special uh, form, okay, the, the family of fw. And W is a huge space of uh, what we call weights, 
okay? And this weight uh, will be adjusted by a dynamical process, okay? So let me now um, be more precise. Uh, sorry. Um, I'm going to describe um, an example uh, of uh, this uh, predictor function that you have here. These are uh, feed-forward feed neural networks, okay? So you, you, you stack layers of neuron, you, 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 you deform X by an affine function, then you apply what is called an activation function, a simple function which is non-linear, often non-smooth, and you do that again and again, and, and you obtain what we call uh, layers. And at the end, you, you have a, a special form of function and you, you, you would like your prediction function to be, to be like that. Okay, so you all know this uh, type of uh, representation of neural networks. I, I, I won't be long uh, on that. Let me skip this one. Um, so the thing is that we, want to uh, learn to um, adjust these uh, weights W. So we are going to make a very simple uh, thing. We are going to uh, attach to the problem um, a kind of a least square uh, approach, if you like. And uh, we wish to, to minimize uh, this uh, type of object, okay? So you have your function FW xi minus yi to the square, okay? And so here, uh, the first thing on which I would like you, I would like you to be aware of is that everything is very big. So the, the number of weight uh, easily exceeds 1 million, more often billions. And the size of the training set, so the n, the size of the sum is also very big. So each numerical action you will make in that world must have a good balance, efficiency, and time cost, okay? And that, 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 that's the, the main thing to understand for, for, for the moment. So how are we going to um, adjust these weights? Well, we are going to uh, adopt a, a very uh, simple, uh, uh, process that you all know very well, I think, or uh, you've heard about. So you have your function J, your cost uh, J, and you see J as a landscape, and you simply are going to follow uh, the steepest uh, descent and uh, hoping to reach uh, a point with a low cost. And uh, at that point, you will have nice. Um, uh, weights. So this is in dimension two, but the, 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 in deep learning, the, the, the costs are awful. Some people have proposed this kind of visualization, which, are, which give a sense of uh, the monstrosity of the problem. Okay. So in terms of mathematics, we are uh, led to this uh, simple uh, Cauchy uh, gradient method. Okay. You make a, a gradient step in, in, in some direction of the gradient, and then you have updated your weights. Uh, so here I have to recall what I just said. Numerical action must have a good balance, if in, uh, if in efficiency, sorry, and time cost. So gi given that N can be higher than 10 to the power four and very often much more. Uh, uh, for ImageNet, uh, we, we have millions. Uh, computing the gradient is extremely costly. So we are not going to compute the gradient, but we are going to compute the gradient of one of the GI, the I being um, uh, random. And uh, we are going to visit all the possible indices and we obtain what, what, what is called the, the, the stochastic uh, gradient method. Uh, okay, but still we need to compute one gradient, okay? Uh, computing one gradient in this world can be extremely costly. So I've made a, a thought experiment to um, 
convey this uh, phenomenon. Assume that for some reason, your machine is able to, to compute the cost of a function on RP, which is the, the, the set on which we are looking at things, uh, in C seconds, C being very low, okay? So typical functions of interest for us will be the GIs or, or the partial derivative of the GI, okay? And so recall that we are interested in computing the gradient of GI, okay? So what we could do with this uh, oracle is uh, simply uh, apply it to all coordinates and compute the gradient, okay? So this is what we do. And when, uh, once uh, this is done, we are going to run the method, okay? So we are going to make a uh, hundred epochs and uh, an epoch is um, a period of time during which uh, the index is uh, going to visit all the sample, okay, of the sum, okay? And now I'm going to make a very strong assumption. Your computation uh, of, uh, of, the cost of, of a cost function is 10 to the minus six, which is extremely fast. Well, if, this cost is 10 to the minus six to uh, make uh, 100 epochs uh, with a reasonable uh, problem. So we have uh, 1 billion uh, weights and uh, 10 to the five uh, samples. You need 300, 300 years to compute the gradient of GI, okay? So you, 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 you need a, a, a much better idea. So uh, this is why there is a kind of cheap uh, gradient principle, uh, which is uh, essential to, to deep learning. Uh, so let me briefly recall the principles that are behind this, uh, this thing. Uh, I take a polynomial. Uh, polynomial, I guess that everyone knows what is it. Um, and um, I uh, attribute to the polynomial a, a computing cost to evaluate the polynomial, which is simply the number of arithmetic computation I need to evaluate uh, uh, this guy. So what is obvious is that uh, if I have a certain cost for evaluating the, the polynomial, the cost for evaluating the gradient is lower than the dimension times the, the cost for evaluating the, the, the function, the polynomial. And there is a wonderful theorem, which tells us that actually we can do much, much better in the sense that the computing cost of the gradient of F and F does not exceed, uh, maybe there is a typo, I think it's six here six times the, the computing cost of F, okay? So if you have a, a clever way of computing the gradient, uh, playing with redundancies, it's very cheap. And this is what is called the bad propagation algorithm. It aggregates smartly partial derivative and you have very fast computation. So it is actually what one, one, uh, one of the things that revolutionized the deep learning. Without this, you cannot train uh, big networks for, for, for the reasons I, I, I just gave. Jérôme, um, okay. excuse me, you, you have like a couple of minutes left. So, time, okay. One or two uh, minutes, or three minutes, well. <laughs> one or two minutes, okay. Uh, so, um, so, so the thing is that we would like uh, to do this also with uh, non-smooth function. Why non-smooth function? Well, because uh, we want a predictor of uh, predict prediction function to, to be able to resemble to on-off uh, function, bandpass, bandpass filters and or preferences ordering, okay? And uh, in that case, uh, what happens is that we need a, a new kind of differentiation because we have non-differentiable function. And the idea is simply to, to, to realize that when you are in this setting uh, as for this function that you see here, the, the, the ReLU function, uh, you have functions that are ramified. You have, you have the choice among many functions. And so 
To compute derivative on this uh, type of object, what you can do is simply brutally uh, differentiate like that. Okay, you differentiate the ramification and you keep the selection. I gave an example here, but uh, apparently I have no time to expose it. Uh, and what is uh, implemented on the library, on modern libraries, is this principle. You differentiate like that. And besides, you use back propagation, which is actually chain rule in all possible uh, setting. So you, you, you make this combination and you have a very fast and very simple training. But there were no, no theoretical ground for uh, explaining what this does. And precisely what we have done recently, and I think I'm going to stop there since uh, time is um, lacking, uh, is that we, we gave a meaning, uh, we gave um, a theory uh, allowing to interpret uh, this uh, differentiation uh, rigorously. And so with this, we are able to, uh, to uh, justify theoretically uh, some uh, many practices uh, in deep learning as for instance, uh, training. So I guess I will stop here. Thank you very much, Ram. Um, are there questions? Yes, I mean, I have a question, but a natural question is, I, I would like to know more what about, <laughs> you know, you're going to say about uh, about uh, this uh, non-smooth analysis applied to this, uh, to this, uh, let's say, uh, solution. I don't know if you can maybe briefly say how non-smooth analysis uh, helped you to, to, to explain these uh, good behaviors in practice. Uh, well, I guess that one of the, 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 the main, um, the main thing, uh, the, the main discovery uh, we have made is that, uh, well, well, the first remark is that you cannot hope for, for some kind of sub-differential, some kind of differential operator. So what TensorFlow or PyTorch does, uh, does not uh, involve uh, a differential operator. It's, it's weird. So, so the, 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 the derivatives are, are, has to be defined uh, without this. And uh, actually the way we define this type of derivative is basically saying that uh, they are just objects that must satisfy uh, a chain rule in, in some, for some absolutely continuous path and, and everything works well. I would need more time to, 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 be, to be meaningful. Uh, but there is also something which is, is a bit weird in this, um, this kind of uh, derivative, is that you, 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 you must allow artifact value. TensorFlow can differentiate, for instance, the function uh, zero, which should return zero. But if the program of zero is a bit cumbersome, it cannot put one at one point, for instance. So, so you have stupid spurious point and you must accept them because it, it, it is how it, it works. So, so this was uh, one of the challenges uh, we met. Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Jerome. And our last speaker before the round table is uh, Francisco Foster. Uh, can you start sharing, Francisco? Uh, Francisco is a uh, uh, faculty of the Data and Artificial Intelligence Initiative of University of Chile. He's a researcher at the Institute of Astrophysics, uh, Millennium Institute of Astrophysics and of CMM, and he's one of the founders and leader of the Alerce uh, Community Brokers um, for the Vera Rubin Observatory. Thank you, Joaquin. Uh, thanks to everyone for staying until the last talk. Uh, so yes, I will talk about alerts, which is this uh, astronomical alert broker. But thanks uh, to Emily, you all know what they are. Uh, this is a large collaboration that is very interdisciplinary with many people, some in, in this meeting. Um, so it's, it's, I will tell you more or less what this is about. So first, uh, I have to tell you that, as Emily mentioned, we are 
We have been selected as one of the Vera Rubin Observatory community brokers. So this is uh, it's very good news because we will have access to this large stream of data probably for the next 10 years. And, and we are we're in, in a unique position because as Ezekiel mentioned, uh, the astronomical resources in Chile are really unique and a big responsibility for, for the Chilean community. So with this broker, we will be able to, to do better use of, uh, of these resources. So just as an introduction again to, to a, little, a bit repeating what Emily said, but the idea of the broker is basically to connect the survey telescopes that these are the, the telescopes that are scanning the sky for changes in different wavelengths from the sky from, from the Earth uh, with follow-up telescopes. So these telescopes will go and look with specialized instruments, the most interesting objects. We're uh, moving to a, a new generation of instruments where you have tens of thousands of fibers that take spectra of different objects simultaneously. And, and some, some system has to connect these two, the survey and the follow-up telescopes. And for this, the alert brokers uh, are, are being developed. And as well as the target and observation managers, which is a different kind of tool that I will mention. So <clears throat> what are this in LSST, Obera Rubin Observatory? It's a telescope that is being built in Chile, but we start operations in 2024. Here you can see a very recent picture. And this is a simulation of where the telescope will be pointing in the sky. So each one of these visits is, is an image of 3 billion pixels uh, that will be taken every 30 seconds. So there will be about a thousand of these images every night. Uh, and every time the, the telescope finds something in the sky that was not there or that changed its position or its brightness, will trigger an alert. And we will get about 10 million alerts per night. So. <clears throat> These are examples of alerts from a different, different telescope today. So, for example, you see here it's a galaxy. And the next night, for example, there is a point source here. And if you subtract the two images, you get a, a, a clean point source. And you will get another one, another one, another one as time goes. And you can see that this object is getting brighter with respect to the galaxy. And eventually, you can build something that we call a light curve, which is just a time series in different bands. And so you have information contained in the images and information contained in this time series. Uh, for example, in this case, it's a supernova, type 1a supernova. And you know that it's a type 1a supernova because you see some bump here in the, the red band. So some, sometimes you need to wait for information to be, to be clear about the, which class these objects are. So what you need in, in the future is, is a, a new layer in this uh, ecosystem. So first we have the we have the acquisition and processing, all the telescopes that we have been doing this for since the 90s with digital cameras. But now we add a new layer of this filtering and classification where the brokers are, are starting to, to, to be important. And then another layer, which is uh, the, how to do the follow-up, how to organize our observations automatically using the input from the brokers. And finally, what you really want to do is to do the physical interpretation to get the physics and insights from the data. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and so usually this, this part is, is the one that takes longer. Uh, and, and we, but we need all these tools to be able to, to get to here. So what is Alerts is a Chile lead initiative to build a community broker for SST and other large ETNU survey telescopes. ETNU is a measure, it's a, it measures the, the size of the mirror and the field of view in the sky. What we want to do is to do fast classification of many astrophysical events, enable the exploration of the, this data set, connect survey and follow-up resources, and always being flexible to, to adapt to different science cases. So we don't know really what will happen in the next five or 10 years. Astronomy is a field that moves quite fast. So some of the scientific questions we want to answer are the nature of explosive events, transients, variable stars, supermassive black holes, and asteroids. There are many, many questions. And there are many also unknown questions, because we don't know what we will find in this uh, new sea of data. So we'll show you some, some of the highlights of the project. Uh, so uh, as I told you, the, the Rubin Observatory is start, is, will start operations in 2024. 
but since 2018, we have a telescope in, in, in the US, in Mont Palomar, it's called the Streaky Transient Facility, that has been producing a, a stream of data that is about 50 times smaller than LSST, and it's kind of a, a precursor. Uh, and we have been ingesting this stream since 2019, and we actually pioneered uh, the real-time classification of this stream using machine learning, uh, using a kind of complex taxonomy that includes it's only a small fraction of all the astrophysical sources that, that we know. Some key numbers, we have ingested uh, billions of data points. We have made uh, and also hundreds of millions of actually detections, images. 50 million of them we have classified uh, based on images, more than 1 million based on the evolution in the light curve. It's a, it's a smaller number because we need to wait to have many detections. And we are sending reports to the community every night with more than 11,000 now uh, supernova candidates sent to, to DNS. Uh, this is the, the transient name server. Uh, all of these products are available in real time. And we have front ends for, for which we need an engineering team dedicated to this project, uh, Python clients, APIs, uh, connection to database. All of these available. Uh, we have developed a, a modular pipeline that works in AWS. Uh, this has been very, very important for to, to do more agile development. We use Docker containers and we scale the, this pipeline using Kubernetes. So basically, as, as the stream of data comes, uh, we cross match with other catalogs. So look for what, what is known about this position in the sky. And then we trigger two, two classifiers, the stand classifier and the light curve classifier that are output to the community for, for people to, to do their science. Uh, so these two parts of the pipeline are based on two classifiers. One that is, a, is, is one based on images, which is a convolutional neural network. Here you can see the, the confusion matrix and it's in this paper. And another one is a light curve based classifier, so based on the time series. And this is the, the publication. And, and, and you see that the, the taxonomy of this second classifier is more complex because you have more data points. You, you can tell more about the source. So this is for fast reaction, and this is for more detailed uh, classification. We have developed many tools, for example, the Explorer, where you can easily explore different categories of objects. So here I'm looking at different objects very quickly. I can fold the light curve if there is a periodic signal. I can in increase the data set with external data. I can look at the image stamps, etc. Many, many things that are kind of being used a lot in the community today. And many of them we, we pioneer. So we, we have a large community of users. This is a map of where the, the people that have access to our uh, website are, are located. So you see more than 100 countries. Uh, really, it's really something that we did not, we did not, did not expect. Um, and we have organized many workshops, some together with Pink uh, that Emily is representing. Uh, and we have made more than 70 recordings available. And we have uh, asked the, the science community uh, what are they, their needs. We have um, classified, I mean, uh, enabled the classification of more than 1,000 supernova. With, so some telescopes are pointed to the sky thanks to uh, the information we provide. Uh, and this is all available for the, uh, for the community. For Rubin, uh, we are planning on a, we need to scale. We need to move to much larger uh, stream of data. And we're switching to something called the Lambda architecture that is based on three layers. One layer that is based on for, for the real time, the online processing, another layer that is for offline processing, which is as important as the online processing, and another layer that allows you to serve uh, the, the, the users. So in, in, the, in the speed layer, if, if, you, if you're familiar with uh, this, we use something called Kafka, that is basically a, a a protocol for sending uh, streams of data. Uh, and for the offline processing, we are using SLORM, that is for, uh, so for LHPC, uh, so HPC tool, and, and Spark, that is for distributed processing. Uh, for the database, we're using SQL and NoSQL uh, databases. Uh, and yes, we also provide many APIs, front ends, and, and Jupyter notebooks. So what are the challenges for the future? 
as I mentioned, is to scale to, to Ruby, uh, but also to scale for multi-stream operations. So we want to ingest data from all the telescopes that are going to be serving the sky. The biggest challenge, I think, for us has been moving from, uh, let's say, academic results to production. So bringing machine learning to production, this is really complex, very hard, requires a big thing. Uh, then how to, should we keep or should we remove the human in the loop? Uh, we want to avoid repetitive tasks, but I think it's important to have some human in the loop, to have some oversight of what is going on and to learn about, to, to get some intuition about the data. So here, user experience and visualization are key. We're developing many outlier detection tools. This is something I haven't mentioned, but perhaps the biggest discoveries from, from the ruin will come from the outliers. We have tried many, many methods. And I think the conclusion so far is that there's no silver bullet. Uh, depends on what you want to do. But one conclusion that we have found is that you always need to have experts to, to really find these outliers, to look at the data and, and ask the right questions. We're also working on domain adaptation, how to prepare for ruling before we have massive amounts of data. And then the biases. We are training with data that we know is not representative of the unlabeled set. So how do we manage these biases? So this, I think these are important questions that are not only important for, for this problem. So in, in this sense, I think this is a kind of pilot, important pilot project and a family of projects that, that could have impact in other areas. So just to finish some uh, highlights again, the, the numbers, we have many tools, Explorer, we have notebooks, we have different tools that I India mentioned. Uh, so it's, it's really, uh, a fun project to work with. Uh, we have made a start a, 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 a big community in Chile and, and abroad. Uh, so thank you. Okay, Th thank you very much, uh, Francisco. Uh, are there questions, comments? Uh, I have a uh, uh, yeah. Was there a question? I have a rather gener gen general question, and it is that much of what you have done, uh, uh, the procedures, implementing, organizing the, the well, the, the information, the even the, the hardware part, but also the organizing the human teams and so on, all of that could be uh, useful, I guess, for other uh, data-driven sciences. And how how are you sharing that that experience or that? Uh, knowledge with, with the community beyond the as, as astronomy? Uh... Yeah, this is a good question. And, and this is something we are asking ourselves always. <laughs> uh, one, one way we, we, we do this is, is for example, form, is by forming people. We have had many engineers that get into the team and then they go to private companies or academia or some other places. Uh, we are also organizing many schools in data science. Mm -hmm. With Harvard, uh, we, in La Serena, we've been participating part of this. We've been teaching uh, uh, data science for astronomers in, in the faculty. But I think we want to go beyond that, and, and we, we want to perhaps do applications using the same thing that we have and, and, and exercising these tools in, in other contexts. And, mm -hmm. and this could allow, also allow us to, to grow as, as a project and to, to get more engineers uh, that are really needed for, to, to, as the complexity of this project evolves. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Francisco. And there is a question by Rodrigo Abarca. Yeah, uh, do you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah, okay, so congratulations for the presentation. It's a very good example. Uh, um, when I am seeing that, I'm saying, okay, I would like to create the same from, from <laughs> the satellite. Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, I am more, yeah, uh, uh, it is it's kind of the same question that uh, has just been made, but uh, I'm thinking on the time and all the hardware, all the software, uh, hold, how did you make or put all this together? How, how much time did it take to <laughs> make? It's a lot of time and, uh, and many years of work, and, and Guillermo is here, and Ignacio is here, who can, can, can also confirm. Uh, it's really, it's, it's result of, I would say, of more than 40, almost six years of, we, we, we've been working on, on this kind of interdisciplinary work. 
we had a previous project where we kind of got, got to know each other. And then this project evolved into Alerse. And I think now we are really having a global impact. Um, takes many years uh, and and, and uh, it, it's very important, of course, to, to, to work with people that you get well, get on well and, 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 and enjoy yeah, what yeah, you're it's doing. True. It's, it's quite complex and, and yeah, yeah, yeah. And, but, but, Guillermo, Guillermo, but, but everywhere on earth as well. Yes, can also yeah, it. and and but, also the the team has grown during these six years, and now we have a very big team. Uh, we have an engineering team which is relatively big, and that means a lot of money. Uh, so that's yeah. I think one of our concerns. It's an expensive project. Yeah. Yeah, also, I think uh, also important you, you are my envy. <laughs> Without, without I, will, I will emulate you. So I will try at least. At least. Um, yeah, just, some, some people, again, that, yeah. just to say that this will be impossible without the like long-term commitment of many institutions, so especially CMM and, and mass. Yeah. So this yeah. really enables us yeah, this to, to project to, to exist. Okay, thank you yeah, very much, yeah. Francisco. Uh, actually, I think this is part of the of the topics that we can uh, address in the in the roundtable. So, if you if you if you like, I, we can make a sh short pause. Let's say three minutes, <laughs> very short, but and then we can go to the to the roundtable. Okay, thank you, thank you very much to thank all you. the speakers. Okay, so we are now back for the for the roundtable discussion. Uh, I will I will shortly uh, present the, the participants of this of this roundtable. Uh, but actually, they will have uh, some minutes at the beginning. It it took them to to introduce themselves and and, and, mo and mostly their their experience and uh, around the data science and either fundamentals applications. And also um, how data is uh, is impacting data science, artificial intelligence, and so on are impacting their disciplines. Okay, so let me briefly uh, present the, the participants of their of their own table. Some of them were already uh, speakers, so I will be uh, uh, quite short. So um, uh, the first is the Jerome Bolt, who is from uh, University Capital Toulouse. Uh, of the Artificial and Natural Intelligence Institute of Toulouse, uh, who uh, was a speaker in, in the previous session. Uh, there also will be Guillermo Cabrera. Guillermo is um, from the University of uh, Concepcion, Computer Science Department, and uh, he works in, uh, in machine learning, computer vision, astroinformatics, and bioinformatics, and he actually is one of the founders also of uh, the Alerse broker. Um, there is also Christophe Prier from uh, um, Grenoble. He is a C CNRS senior researcher from the group uh, GIPSA, which is uh, Grenoble Images, Parallel and Signal uh, Automatics. And um, he's chair of the Artificial Intelligence and Dynamical Systems in, in the Multidisciplinary Institute of Artificial Intelligence of Grenoble. And uh, there also will be in the round table, uh, we will have Gaspar Galas, who is a professor at the Institute of Astrophysics of University, Catholic University of Chile, a member of the uh, Franco-Chilean Laboratory of Astronomy, which is a, a CNRS uh, associated unit. Um, and finally, uh, we will also have um, uh, Jean-Stéphane Dersan, who is uh, who is already presented. I, I, I should also, Add uh, that he's um, sorry. I have uh, <laughs> well. He's a, a deputy uh, director in CNRS, and uh, uh, he's uh, he's in charge of the COVID uh, COVID research group of the of CNRS. Okay, so please you can of course complement if there's something I didn't mention. <laughs> okay, so uh, maybe we can start in the order of the of the um, of the of the web page. So Jerome, if you if you would like to speak a, a couple of, of minutes about your your work and experience uh, in, in in the topics of data science and data or data driven sciences.
you hear me? It's okay now. Yes. So, so, so there's no specific question. Just my experience in the right. Ah, uh, sorry. Science. Uh, uh, yeah. Jerome, Jerome. Uh, my, uh, excuse me. I, I forgot to present Jocelyn. <laughs> sorry, Jocelyn Dunson, who is always also a member of the of the panel. So, well, she 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 was already a speaker. So she was already presented, but I forgot to mention. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, please. Uh, okay. Uh, well, I'm. Um, I think uh, I'm quite new uh, to data sciences. Uh, my uh, um, involvement uh, started uh, recently uh, because of the um, what we call in France the, the Plan Villani uh, for uh, artificial uh, intelligence, and uh, so. Uh, some uh, considerable uh, amounts of money were put on some centers uh, in, uh, through, throughout the country. And um, uh, we had the chance to, 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 uh, to be one of these centers in Toulouse. And uh, as an optimizer, I, um, I started uh, working uh, on this topic. And um, this is why I've been uh, involved uh, deeply in deep learning. And uh, well, that's pretty all. I don't know if I answered the, the question. This is, yeah. Maybe you would like to mention the type of interactions you have in, the, in this institute uh, with other disciplines or around these topics? Uh, oh, okay. So the, the institute uh, in Toulouse uh, has a wide scope. Uh, we have uh, people, people from economics, we have people from psychology, we have people from law. Uh, we, we have a famous uh, Chilean uh, guy uh, who, who mm -hmm. you know, who's called uh, Cesar Hidalgo, I guess. He's, he's one of the, the stars uh, in, uh, in Toulouse as well. <laughs> and, um, and well, as for interaction, uh, they, they, they are uh, starting. There is also, of course, uh, industry that I did not mention. Um, well, they, they, they are uh, starting uh, slowly. For instance, they are. Uh, uh, surprising uh, studies, uh, uh, mixing low and, uh, and deep learning, for instance, uh, on, uh, on fairness, on the, 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 the outcomes uh, of uh, certain trials, the, depending on the characteristics of, uh, uh, of uh, these accusés. Uh, what's the name in English? Uh, I don't have the words for that. Um, Yes, I would say that. Yeah, that's pretty. All right. So, so, so the, there is a, also, um, as everywhere, I guess, uh, a strong pressure to um, to push us to analyze the questions of uh, uh, robustness uh, of uh, of prediction, which is which is of major importance for for many industrial people. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's even more critical uh, in the uh, aviation world, in which uh, you mm -hmm. don't have the right to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Otherwise, it's it's quite uh, costly. Okay, which is very important in, in Toulouse, actually. <laughs> the, yeah, the, yeah, the I should, yeah, yeah, because okay. Airbus is uh, in Toulouse. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Jerome. Uh, Christophe, uh, can you can you hear us? Yeah. Yes, I can hear you. So, thanks for the invitation to to participate to this one table. Can you hear mm -hmm. me? Yes. Yeah. Very well. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, if you don't mind, maybe I can uh, just uh, talk a while about my uh, my concerns mm -hmm. in research and in data driven uh, systems. Right. Fine. Yeah. So um, we are also working on uh, a lot of uh, 
of data-driven systems, uh, in particular with AI, but not only, of course. So we, in particular, he, he seems to us that uh, AI uh, uh, database uh, uh, approach gi give us uh, new new ways to and uh, new ways to to solve uh, very difficult problems that are quite now by, by now very classics. If you think about uh, Kaman filters, so you know Kaman filter and uh, so-called external Kaman filter. So they, they, are, they are very basic uh, question for nonlinear system for which you have to, to design the optimal Kaman filters. And such a basic question uh, uh, are ve usually very difficult to be solved. And today we, we had uh, here in Grenoble, uh, PhD defense about that. And uh, it seems to, to us that uh, AI-based uh, techniques uh, uh, success to, to to uh, give us a new uh, new measures and new ways to to uh, compute uh, Kalman filters mm -hmm. and Kalman observers. So uh, this is very this is great to to uh, think about very classic uh, question uh, and uh, using uh, very recent uh, uh, techniques. So if I'm uh, just, I, I forgot to, to give you uh, some information about myself. So I'm working on uh, uh, control theory and observation problems. So I'm not I'm, uh, for engineering applications. So uh, we, we are at the interface of different techniques coming from applied math, engineers, physics for models, and uh, of course, informatics as well and the, the machine learning techniques. So this is, uh, you, you know, that when you, you have industrial uh, question and uh, industrial partners that comes to you and say that, okay, I have a big trouble because I'm consuming uh, more energy than the, my, my neighborhood. I, but uh, a priori, we don't know what is, uh, what is the problem. So we need to, we don't know to which uh, uh, domain we have to face. So is it a problem of physics modeling? Is it a problem of informatics? Is something like that. So database techniques are very interesting because now we have more data that, uh, than, mm -hmm. that we need at the end <laughs> to, solve, to solve problems. So this is something that we need to, to face. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Christophe. Uh, just for my uh, introduction. Uh, now, um, it's the turn of uh, Gaspar. Gaspar Galas, can you, can you hear hello. us? Hello, yes. Thanks for the opportunity. So, hello, everyone. Bonjour tout le monde. Hola a todos. Um, well, I am here just because I was uh, the former chair of the Institute of Astrophysics at Catolica. Now is Felipe Barrientos, who is in fact here, but he told me that uh, it's better that I, I can talk because I, I, I I perhaps I, I spend much more time than his for, for this UME, uh, UMI or FSLLA, sorry, the, the FS, FCLA, LA. Uh, this is a French Chilean laboratory for astronomy, um, working with the, the team and managing the, the, the visit of, of the visiting of uh, researchers in Chile. So I'm just going to talk about this uh, French Chilean lab for astronomy, just a couple of minutes. So I will introduce this, making a presentation. Let me let me share screen. Uh, uh, I think you are looking the thing, no? Yes. Everyone is looking the, the presentation. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So very briefly, this is a French Chilean collaboration that started in. 2011 or something like that. Uh, that was was was, was uh, motivated by Universidad de Chile, Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile, Concep Universidad de Concepción, and the CNRS. Uh, and then the idea is to foster um, astronomy, astronomical research in the southern sphere uh, between these four universities, the three universities in, in Chile, and uh, researchers um, linked to the CNRS. So uh, there has been a lot of people coming and back and forth, and mostly most of them were working at the uh, Universidad de Chile. Uh, and at the beginning of this collaboration, uh, 
the, the centers started to work mostly in 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 stellar formation and also in protoplanetary disks uh, with people at the University of Chile and then uh, slowly this was uh, expanded to other universities in Chile in principle in, in particular the other two universities at Católica and Concepción and now I think there were uh, researchers passing through uh, these two universities Católica and Concepción as well as uh, the University of Chile so the idea is to have visits uh, from researchers from from France in principle uh, the original project state that researchers has to spend three years in Chile, which is of course not easy because uh, uh, the researchers are, are going to be paid by France and also they have to be installed in Chile with the families and all the people, all the people they are carrying and uh, it's not easy. And then we, since some years ago, we changed that a little bit and we had we had the possibility that people can visit Chile and France in short term visits. So this is the FSLA board in 2021. This is the current people that are managing the, the UMI. This is the, I prefer to call it UMI. It's, it's much uh, better than FSLA. I, I don't, really, I don't know how to, to spell that. If I, it's in French or Spanish or English, I don't know. But anyway, so the UMI, uh, this is the, these are the, the people in charge now. It's uh, Guy Perrin, is the INSU director. Felipe Barrientos is uh, the, the chair of the Catholica, and now is who is in chair of the FSLA, uh, in fact. Patricio Rojo, the director, the, the current director of uh, chair of University of Chile Astronomy Department, and Neil Nagar also is the chair of the Astronomy Department at Universidad de Concepción. And we have a deputy director who is uh, Gael Chauvin, who is uh, now uh, I think is going to depart quite soon, I think. But, uh, and then former board members were the chairs of the, the same institutes and departments uh, some years ago. That's it. We, are, we, we, we have uh, Luc Desart, François Menard, Pierre Kervela also was there and worked a lot in the, between the years, I would say 2014 and 2018. Okay, uh, Andres Escala was a former director of, uh, of Cerro Calan, the Astronomy Department of, of, in the University of Chile, and also Guido Garay. Okay. Well, uh, we, there have been many collaborators. These close collaborators that are um, uh, noted here are those uh, who are more who are aware, more related to the science and also to the management of the UNE. And um, uh, recent visitors, Okay, uh, in 2020 and 2021, where these this researchers, uh, Miriam Benisti, Gail Chauvin, and Stefan Blondin, uh, these two, the, the two first were allocated at uh, Universidad de Chile, and Stefan Blondin was at Católica. Yes? Uh, no, I just wanted to suggest to maybe uh, right. leave some of the details of the collaborations uh, yes. to the discussion because uh, we okay. will precisely talk about the yeah. French. Uh, okay, I, I will go very, very deep into the, very, very fast into in the science. The, the, the topics of this uh, collaboration was, is, is basically all this, the astronomy we are doing in all departments. It's not uh, planetary science or cosmologies. Basically, all the science we are doing at, uh, in Chile in the three universities and people working at the CNRS which covers, in fact, the whole astronomy, right? So, but what was uh, stressed in the last years, because we received people working on this, is uh, planetary formation, exoplanets, stellar physics, and uh, supernovae also, and some things related to, to stellar astronomy, astrometry, okay? Asteroids and other things. Um, okay, so uh, there will be a new call in 2022, okay? Uh, there are two positions. Deadline where it was in fact in September 15. Uh, we received some some applications, mm. and that's it. Basically, that with this this money for for exchange of people back and forth, and also for students, postdocs, and all kind of things you can you can imagine. Okay, um, this is funded okay. by CRS almost uh, full. Yeah, this is okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you Gaspar. Yes. And now uh, now it's. Uh... Up to Guillermo to, to present himself, introduce himself. 
represents his work. Guillermo Cabrera from the Universidad de Concepción. Yeah, thank you, Joaquin. I'm going to try to stick to my three minutes, uh, so I'm going to be very brief. Uh, so I just want to mention that I did my undergrad in astronomy and computer science. My PhD was in computer science, but I always worked with astronomy data, right? I, my PhD was on uh, biased uh, algorithms and debiasing the data. Um, so at some point I met uh, Francisco and uh, we were at CMM at that time. And uh, we started working on detecting supernovae in real time which turned to, into Alersi now. So now we have Alersi, which is this uh, huge system. It's kind of complicated. Uh, we have a large team working on it, uh, which as I said, it, as Francisco said, sorry, uh, it's, uh, it's thanks to funding from centers such as MASS, CMM, the Data Observatory. Uh, so it's a complex system that requires a lot of people and uh, a lot of money. Um, that said, I also wanted to tell you that uh, I was working on all these machine learning methods and new machine lear learning methods that were driven by astronomy questions and astronomy data. So the algorithms need to be new because th there are new problems that arises from new data coming from uh, these telescopes. And um, I was working on that. And at some point, uh, someone from the industry came to me and asked me if I could help them. So that's, that was the start of the data science unit at University of Concepcion. And uh, that has grown impressively during the last two years. It's basically a, a unit that works closely with other organizations and companies and solves problems for them. Um, so right now we have like 15 engineers. Uh, it's totally self-funded through uh, these agreements with the industry. Uh, so we have no funding from from um, from any na national agency or or something like that, and uh, so the thing is that I think you can do it. I mean, it's like now the the only the, the only thing that that you need to do in order for this to happen is that uh, you need to spend a lot of money, uh, sorry, a lot of time from some faculty that are willing to push this forward. Uh, it's not simple. I mean, it took me a lot of time to build it. Now we, now it's running like on, his, on its own. I have hired a, a, a deputy director who runs everything behind my back. And I just we just meet once per week and it's kind of relatively simple for me. So I think that, so this is like one of those cases where basic research on astronomy creating new tools, new machine learning tools, got some strong impact into the industry. And uh, the thing is that when we're working on problems uh, coming from literacy, what happens is that th those are really challenging problems. But when you go to the industry, they are not that challenging. I mean, they usually require out of the shelf solutions. But when we work on literacy, we need to think about new solutions. So it's 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 relatively straightforward to get someone who did his master's or his PhD in something related to allergy and put it to work in the industry. So I think that's kind of a, a success. And so yeah, that's it. Thank you very much, uh, Guillermo. We will have time to to come to these uh, very interesting uh, experiences and, and uh, in the the rest of the of the roundtable. Uh, our next speaker is, uh, uh, or participant is uh, Jocelyn Constant. Hello. Yeah. Has um, Guillermo started to say his background? I, I, I found many, maybe interesting to say that I'm a physicist and I have been working in data science like for five years or so. Or so. And none of us study data science as an undergrad. There is no we are all mathematicians or physicists, and I think it's interesting how how it's a different world in terms of I don't know publications or how how much there is transference to the industry. I mean, most of us, like Guillermo said, we had to build like a team of engineers to do projects with the industry. The French have said that too, and I think it's something very very uncommon for a mathematician that I don't know at the beginning was. Um, uh, working on theorems to work on something very, very applied that data science uh, allows. So I work principally on medicine and there are some 
challenges that, that are very suitable for data science, which are analyzing large data sets. In general, medical doctors are not trained to work on like large data sets. They, they usually work on, or like public health schools, they still work on Excel, maybe R, but Python is not very common. So there is, there is a, an opportunity there, but also on unstructured information, let's say images and text. Um, so here, so there, there is, I think that an opportunity for support the decision-making and, um, and there, there is some, I, I, I wouldn't say that there is a lot of fear, uh, but there is some concern about how machines will maybe replace some actions or some uh, duties of uh, medical doctors. And, and we try to, to, point, to make the point that there is no, it, it is not a replacement, it's a, it's a tool for improving the uh, deficiency of the clinical practice or giving a second, a second uh, check if everything is, is going okay. But in general, our projects that require a lot of interaction, there's, it's very interdisciplinary to work on data science in medicine because you need to understand what's going on and how you can really make something meaningful on that. Like I, I, pass, I see passing the link that Francisco showed like about uh, ER working on COVID problems and may, many of them didn't work. I mean, the, the article is very like drastic, not, nothing worked. Uh, I have I have seen things working, but but in general you need a, like a very clear um, understanding of the problem and, and like a, make a very easy tool that can be um, used in the pipeline in the uh, or in the workflow of the hospital without much uh, noise and creating like new te uh, techniques or uh, tools uh, from the people. Okay. Okay, thank you very much for, for, for sharing your, your experience. And uh, Jean Stefan, can you hear us? Okay. Um, so, uh, first of all, I, I would like to say that as a researcher, I'm not using data at all. I'm doing math very fundamental. But um, as uh, Hector mentioned, uh, I'm also. Uh, Deputy Scientific Director at uh, the Institute of Math of uh, CNRS. And uh, during the, the pandemic, I, uh, I also created a, a group uh, about modelization of the, the, the pandemic and around the pandemic. And uh, as, um, as you have probably seen, uh, the, the main problem was the access to, to the data. So um, what I wanted to say is that uh, um, uh, Jérôme said that uh, we have a lot of data, but in fact, it's not uh, uh, really exact. Uh, you have uh, two kinds of people, I would say, the, the people who, are, who produce the data and uh, the, pro the, the people who, who know how, uh, what to do with the, this data. And um, so Jocelyn said that uh, medical doctor use uh, Excel to to, to say something about the data. So I think it's very important that people who produce the data, who know how to produce data, can share this data with other people uh, who, who know uh, uh, what to do the, with this data. And it is what we, we wanted to do with, uh, with health data. And I'm involved in the uh, at CNRS uh, level to, uh, to make this uh, health data more open uh, or at least uh, uh, more accessible to, to researchers. So I think that it's a, a big challenge to, to connect these people to who know how to get the data and the people who know how to, to do something with. And uh, it, it's very often a problem because the, the people who produce the data, they want to, to keep them, uh, even if they don't know what to do with. Uh, so I, 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 I think that it's a big challenge that uh, that I shared and open. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Jean Stefan. Uh, before uh, proposing a couple of questions, I, I would like to, to mention that this, uh, what we're going to discuss here, uh, 
part of it will be presented to some authorities, uh, hopefully at, at highest levels in science ministry or others in Chile, at least. And, and it would be interesting to 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 extract uh, well the, the important points and concerns that have been uh, uh, mentioned. So feel free to 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 talk about anything that you you consider important. Okay, so. I will. I will to 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 give a framework. I I, I will. Um, I would like to 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 open the discussion with a, with a, with a question, and it is, well, each of us has been confronted to data, data science, and artificial intelligence coming from different backgrounds, and and for all of us, it is has. Uh, um, it has brought uh, important uh, modifications on what, where to focus, how to 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 be interdisciplinary, where to where to to with whom to associate, or and so on. So, uh, what is my, my question? Would be the question would be what do you think in, in your case is is driving uh, data data driven sciences? Actually, is it the scientific questions? The data, the technology which is available, the sensors, let's say, how the, the models are we are we what is what are the drivers are, or what are the drivers that are maybe missing? What is the interactions that are missing? Uh, because one sees that we have lots of data available in some domains, uh, and for instance, in astronomy, there is people working on how to how to use uh, um, add value to this data, but in other domains. There are lots of uh, data, there are models, but they are not uh, maybe uh, interacting as, as they should. So what, what can we, what are the virtuous interactions that we should look for and, and, and what is missing? I mean, that we, we could still uh, do as institutions and as uh, individuals in, in science. I don't know if uh, somebody wants, wants to, to say something about that. So I think it's all of what you mentioned. Uh, <laughs> it's it's all that and more. Uh, so what's driving data sciences right right now? I mean, like data driven sciences, is we're producing a lot of data uh, through different new sensors that are being built or through the internet, and uh, at the same time we need to analyze that data in a fast manner, and. Uh, for that, we need new methods, we need to store it, we need the hardware, we need the, the, the networks to, to transfer the data. So it's all of that. But also it has a, a disciplinary component, which is basically it, all the data is related to a particular or, or a set of disciplines, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it also, so this, that's why you say this is an interdisciplinary field, right? Because you need to address all those uh, different uh, uh, aspects of the data. And, and in your case, uh, Falerse, how have you been able to to put the actors uh, in, in in relation and in order to to make things work? Because it's well, as, as Francisco was saying, it's, it took a lot of time. But how can you extrapolate this experience? Uh, do you think to other disciplines, or what do what you advise, or what do, do you need from I don't know institution institutional support? So the, the, the case of Alerse was kind of, I mean, it was the, the closest to us. Uh, in that case, at, at the beginning, it was like three or four of us. Um, but we noticed that a small group of people could not build such a complex system. Mm -hmm. So we started collaborating with other colleagues from other fields. I would say that maybe one of the one of many other aspects that's important in in Alerse, it's uh, the machine learning part, but it's basically because that's how it started. I mean, Francisco at that time uh, was posing a problem. I was a guy who was working on machine learning and we converged into that. Uh, but it, it has a lot to do with software development, uh, uh, designing architectures for, for like big data architectures uh, where is this going to be stored in the cloud or in, in a local storage system or where is everything going to be processed? So it's super interdisciplinary. And to be honest, I'm not an expert in all of those fields. I just need to know how to, un how to talk to the experts and, and understand them. And I think that Pancho agrees with me, right, Pancho? Yes, definitely. And I would add one more thing that that's something we learned more recently is uh, this 
agile ways of working that we I didn't know of and, and this was brought by the engineering team and I think this is key. So behind the layer C, which is like a scientific system, there's a lot of engineering, like a lot of engineering. It couldn't happen without the engineers. Mm -hmm. And uh, something which is ha happens to, to in, from in different disciplines and different sciences using uh, data on artificial intelligence to deal with their data uh, is uh, that you have some models from physics, from, from mathematics, and you have the data. And, and what do you do with both of them? That's, I think that's an important issue to, to really uh, create uh, frequent interactions. I don't know if, uh, for instance, Christoph, I, I think you're, 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 yeah, thanks. you live in that interface. In yeah, yeah. Thanks for uh, giving me this opportunity. So maybe something that we can, all or or us can help is about uh, proving some things. So it is good to, 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 to look on data uh, system, to look on models, but we are all uh, researchers and uh, guys wanting to prove something. So it is not only, uh, okay, it seems, mm. so, so we have discussed about uh, pandemic situation. Jean-Stéphane Jean has, has spoken about that. Uh, so with uh, COVID-19, we have too much data actually, but mm. okay, what else? What can mm -hmm. we prove? What can we model? What can we can we predict? Uh, not uh, in one year, but at least uh, next next two days, next weekend. So something like, like that. So this is something that we need to prove, and I, I guess that our our job and uh, the collaboration with applied math, with engineering, with physics, with uh, bio mathematics, could be very helpful in proving something. So this is something that could probably Google or Facebook or very huge companies. So, I mean, I am very modest. I, probably we cannot uh, be uh, competitive in AI, but we can be competitive in proving something with data. So this is something probably we, for which we can uh, be uh, have great contributions. We cannot uh, counteract uh, Google. We cannot be as good as Google, but we can probably be uh, better than Google in proving something with uh, Mm. after managing data, if you see what I mean, Joaquin. Mm -hmm. So this is just a point of view that I wanted to share with you mm -hmm. today. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Rusov. Yes, I think that's a, that's a very interesting point when it really comes to uh, making data science and artificial intelligence useful for, for sciences which are not I mean, not just big tech in, industry leading. It's really like questions uh, uh, driven by uh, national uh, problems or societal problems or scientific problems. And uh, well, this is also something I, 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 we, we, it, it, it would be good to discuss because, uh, well, several countries like Chile, France are doing their national policies about uh, uh, artificial intelligence. And uh, uh, there is a bias of thinking that artificial intelligence and, 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 and data is about uh, having the technology and, and uh, uh, implementing, I don't know, uh, 5G uh, cell phones, for instance, in Chile, so something quite, quite absurd, I should say. And actually, there are lots of problems in Chile, uh, concrete problems uh, that impact people's lives that should be, could be improved, uh, so bringing efforts in, in, in from different points of view, as, as you said, uh, Christoph. So, I, I, I don't know, what do you think about that? I mean, that's, uh, I mean, that's a question for all the, all the, uh, participants, but uh, what? Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. Does anybody want to share some opinion about that, or 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 some uh, demands that could be made to the uh, scientific authorities in Chile or or in France? Yeah, or, maybe or... I I, yeah. I could make I could comment on that. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, besides all what they have said, like the challenges and also the colleague in France saying like, we cannot compete with uh, Google. I think that um, in the case of medicine, we have the, the political issues, which means is the government of this turn uh, willing to give us data or willing to make a project with the University of Chile or whatever university, but with researchers, to do something for the public healthcare system. And I think, I don't know how it is in France. I hope that it's better than here, but 
there is a lot of things about like um like someone that was minister uh, at some moment and now is a is in a university that university has a lot of power if there is is the same party at, which is the government right now uh, so i will say that uh, we we face that thing that we because if you work with public health in a in a problem that occurs in the public healthcare system and you design and you write a paper and you go to a conference whatever i mean the point at the first point to start doing that was to help people in the public health care system so it's a bit uh, annoying to to have a system that recognizes patients that are misclassified and then you cannot put it in practice because you don't have access to the government to give it for free to the government so um i hope it's it's better in france and also we have to fight the thing that the our engineers or or scientists they are very um I mean, the industry requires them as well, and they give them better chances. I mean, like economical, in from the economical aspects, sometimes um, contracts that are better than what we can do in the in the in the academic setting. So I think that there are these two things that I I suffer the most. Thank you, Jocelyn. Uh, I, I think Luis uh, Felipe Barrientos is, uh, yeah. has a has a question or comment. Yeah, first, you know, it's, uh, well, to thank the SPAD, you know, because introducing the FCLA, which I'm the director right now, I was teaching, so I couldn't get him in, in time. Anyway, I, I think a couple of things on the, on the uh, interface or, you know, the, the interdisciplinary things of uh, data science, uh, data-driven science, I think the astronomers, we, we do have a problem, you know, handling, you know, many, many um, large amounts of data. And, but we do have to be good in answering, trying to answer the questions so we can talk to the computer science people and try to, you know, see where the, they can help us in, in order to work together. So I think the important thing here is try to build, you know, places where we can talk, we can, you know, this kind of environment, we can, where we can talk and we can move ahead in, in different projects. And the FCLA is one of those, pro those uh, environments where, you know, astronomers and scientists, different scientists can also uh, get together. And the other thing, you know, I think is important is to have uh, PhD students involved in this science because they finally, they um, foster, they, they take advantage of what the astronomers know and what the data and science scientists know. So I think in, in the past, we have had some uh, success on recruiting PhD students either in France, getting funding for PhD students in France. And we would like to extend that to Chile and have something like, you know, um, go to tell, uh, you know, dual degrees or co programs between France and Chile, which is uh, to simplify that because now it's very complicated in order to, to, to have such a, uh, such a program. And the other thing that we think, you know, it could be very helpful for this interaction is to create this funding between a ANR and ANIT, the, our currency. So in order to apply for programs, you know, at the larger scale that can be funded and, you know, students or and science can be, can be used, uh, can be uh, proposed to that. So that would be my, mm -hmm. again, my, my take on this. Thank you, Felipe. It's, it's an interesting idea. Uh, John Stefan, uh, would you like to, to comment also? Yes, no, I, I wanted to answer uh, one question. Uh, by, uh, by Jocelyn and uh, Francisco has written some reaction about this. It's about uh, what, what we have in France for this, uh, this uh, access to data uh, during the pandemic. Uh, I think that uh, in, in France, uh, we had a lot of data which have been opened by the government. So it, it was quite easy to have a, a, a lot of uh, data about, uh, about the pandemic, uh, where the cases were, uh, uh, 
uh, about vaccination, ma many, many things. But uh, so you, you have this uh, open data and open, really open to the public uh, access on, on, on the website of the government. So uh, that was a good point. But after that, for the rest of the, of the data, it was absolutely impossible even for researchers to access uh, the, this data. So you have two kinds of data. Uh, the first one, which is uh, really easy to, to access. And uh, it, it was really a, a good thing and, uh, in France. And, uh, and for the other ones, it was a nightmare. And uh, I think that uh, nobody, even, even the researcher used by the government uh, for projection, uh, they could not uh, access to that because it was too complicated. Uh, and during the pandemic, when you need uh, six months to access the data, it's, uh, it's just uh, uh, impossible to do. Uh, so uh, the good point was a lot of open data and the bad point was for the rest of the health data, it's absolutely impossible for researchers to access them. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you, uh, Jean-Stéphane. Uh, do you think, uh, well, th there have been a lot of says, ideas and, and, and suggestions, but uh, do you think there are uh, other barriers uh, hindering the, 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 let's say, the development of, of, of data science, but uh, uh, as something with social value, social impact, I would say. I mean, not just because we are, as, as uh, Christoph said, we're not trying to be Google, that's not the idea, uh, but, uh, we see that a lot of we have lots of data from different sources, uh, which are important for scientific or real applications. We have the the, the capacity to build models, to, to but it's difficult to to make things happen. It's not that simple. So, you mentioned the av availability of data as, as some possible uh, barrier. Also, uh, maybe uh, Jocelyn mentioned in 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 medicine, the, the people is maybe not too does not trust enough uh, data data science and, and, and so on. And also there is the, the problem of uh, capacity building. So, uh, I mean, as, as Felipe said, uh, giving young people, uh, putting young people to work in the interaction because maybe it's not uh, uh, as the older people who's going to do it. So what do you think we, we could still do as scientists or academia? What should we do to, to, to make uh, that, that data science and artificial intelligence has a larger impact in, in, in a better impact also in for our society, for our countries. I don't know if somebody wants to... Ah, yeah, we have uh, Guillermo and then uh, Gaspar. If you want. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that yesterday there was uh, this talk about the AI 100 report. I'm not sure if you heard about that, but it's basically a report made by experts in AI thinking about what's going to happen in the next 100 years with AI. All right. Mm -hmm. And uh, so basically one of the of the concerns that's within the community, these are all people from academia, right? So one of the concerns is that um, right now um, artificial intelligence is being mostly led by the industry. So we have Google, mm -hmm. we have Facebook, all of those are leading everything. But uh, they're not usually worried about the ethics and uh, regularization issues that, that come with this, right? Mm -hmm. So they just want a product to work, right? So they don't care too much if, they, if those are biased or not, if uh, those have a negative impact on the society. So, um, so I think that's one of the, or, or the hardest to solve problems right now, right? So basically, if you say this model is biased, right? Well, it's biased because the data that it, that they're using it's related to our data. It's data produced by humans. So I, I'm. It's much harder to debias a human than debias an artificial intelligence model, right? Uh, so those all those are concerns that should be addressed. Now, the thing is that what would you expect from the government to do? or for, from the society in general to do related to social impact of uh, data science in general, data products. So for example, uh, what Jocelyn mentioned, it's like an obvious question, like uh, what we need the data, right? I mean, we could help you, Mr. Government, we could help you, but in order to do that, we need the data. But 
Uh, if you need help, Mr. Government, to help on, on social issues, then you should trust on us. So it's, it's a question of trusting, trust between the, the universities, the, the academia and the governments. And ideally you would build like a, a large environment where the industry, the academia and the government would all help towards uh, making tools for the society. Mm -hmm. uh, Gaspar, would you like to... Thanks, uh, Joaquin. And I, I agree with, completely with, uh, with Guillermo. And, uh, but the, your question, um, Joaquin, turns around my head about what could be the impact that uh, the scientists and the people who, who is working with uh, data science can do to the society itself. And I think there is one single thing that uh, was not uh, touched here in this discussion, at least when I, from when I, I, I joined the, 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 the team, uh, that was not mentioned and I think is very important for bringing the society with the, the concept and the science of big numbers and statistics and data science, which is the learning or the teaching, more the teaching of statistics, statistics in the schools, in high school. Uh, when you talk to scholars and high school people in, in Chile, they don't have any idea about uh, data science. The only thing they know if, is what is the average of numbers and uh, what means a large number, that's it, nothing more. So uh, I think that to, in order to have more impact of this new science, this new universe that is that the people working in big data and artificial intelligence and all the things we can do to the society is first to teach the young boys and people about what is statistics. Because we don't have, we don't, we are not going to improve anything is if the people start to hear from the media, from the TV, the journal, the, the newspapers about artificial intelligence and data science, that seems to be something like a, what we call in Chile the frase hecha, right? It's mm -hmm. like, a, like a thing that is, is a brick that is there. Uh, data science is the magic word, but nobody knows about that. Nobody knows what really is inside this, this concept and which is inside that is statistics. Mm -hmm. Is the, the, the mathematical, I mean, the, the, the idea of statistics of mathematics and the people, the, the society in general, don't have any idea about that. There are rules of mathematics, right, mm -hmm. that uh, regulate the, 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 the behavior of the big numbers, of the statistics, of the data science. But nobody knows about that from the beginning. So I think that the society much improve a lot on, on this and will really know what is that if they know better ideas about statistics, first of all, be <laughs> before uh, to introduce uh, data science itself, right? Thank you, Gaspar. Yes, I, I agree with you. Well, of course, we have a, a historic, a very big problem with education in, in, in Chile. But uh, I, would also, I would also add maybe that maybe at the scale in which we work uh, by uh, training uh, professionals, engineers, scientists, uh, maybe there is also that we can do in the sense that as you said, uh, big data or artificial intelligence is kind of a, a, a phrase, and, and people just just are being prepared to buy, to buy, to buy from Google, to buy from, and not and not not just the uh, young people. I also mean, uh, I don't know the, the uh, people in the industry, people uh, having important positions, stakeholders. They are ready just to buy, and I think uh, they are not doing either what you what you're saying. I mean, uh, really understanding what's behind behind and the and there's the point of uh, of uh, how to say autonomy or sovereignty in a way uh, of with technology i mean we are already dependent of lots of technologies that we don't build that we don't quite understand quite well but maybe this is one of the technologies and the and the, and the um, knowledge uh, fields where we can still uh, get involved and not not be too late and and, and more importantly get involved uh, Around topics that are important for us as a country, so, so I think that's that's a, an important point that could be could be taken into account into, into discussion or in, in the, the proposals to to authorities in, in science. But also, would, I would like to ask you, uh, how do you, what do you think we, we could do in this in this direction regarding uh, French-Chilean cooperation? Because uh, 
well, there are lots of academic uh, scientific cooperation programs, but we know we, we are realizing that this is a bigger issue. It has some it's an impact in society. It has possible, it opens the door to uh, quicker development, economical developments in, in some areas which are uh, can take advantage of this technology. So, so how could we interact in this in this uh, in this uh, direction with with France better than what we do now? What kind of programs can we try to put in place? Exchange programs for, for students, or maybe uh, interdisciplinary programs. Uh, yeah, what, 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 how how could we? Take advantage of the existing Chile-France cooperation to to foster these these uh, questions and, and be better <laughs> for both for both uh, countries. I don't know. Somebody has some ideas. Uh, of course, the the training people, training young people, is is fundamental, and maybe we are still not. Uh, doing it in the in the best way in order to to increase the impact of this of these disciplines because it's interdisciplinary. Typically, our our programs, uh, postdocs, uh, scholarships, and so on are really in, inside one discipline. So I don't know. Do you think of this question, open question, that we could do better in this in this direction uh, in the context of French Chilean cooperation, or how could we? Do better. Well, it would be great to have the French cooperation for teaching teachers in high school about all we are talking about. That would be great. For me, it's a since I work in language, it's a bit it's a bit hard because uh, then annotation guidelines, for example, is something that we would like to share across, across countries. And well, the, the, the one annotation is in French and the other in Spanish. We, we usually, sometimes we go in the middle and we share it in English, but it's not so easy. And I think that there are some, some challenges that are a bit uh, um, different. For example, I'm, I'm right now writing a paper with my colleague from France, and we want to write how to start doing natural language processing in medicine. And we, we are willing, we are discussing, for example, the access to conferences, the distance to go to the conference, because actually the COVID made us a bit more equal, different countries. But you in Europe, you are in a much better position to go to conference and organize conference that we are here. So we are trying to kind of make a, make a point about that. Like for example, the access to, to conference or publishing opportunities and things like that. So I think that in some way we have uh, similar challenges, but at the same time, my impression is that you are a bit better in terms of uh, the, the access and the, the, the geographical location of, of where is the thing, I mean, we are both far from the US, but um, I mean, um, what I mean is that there are things that we have in common, but also there are things that they are very different. Uh, personally, I have the, 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 the feeling that the solutions uh, the, are not in, your, in our hands. Uh, because uh, what, what makes um, the USA uh, so strong is uh, this uh, living full, um, uh, how to say that, this, this many startups that they have, the, 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 this uh, creation of uh, of new ideas of new uh, and and so and so there is a university on the one hand and on the other hand there are uh, firms startups and uh, uh, studying at university uh, as a as a true meaning because you end up in this type of startups and there is a, a kind of a intellectual adventure that that you can take so uh, I don't know how, 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 what you can do in Chile, but uh, I, I, I guess that the, the creation of uh, these uh, startups uh, should be uh, greatly uh, facilitated. This is, uh, I think, this, this is uh, extremely uh, important. And I also agree with Gaspar uh, on, the, on the fact that uh, 
we, 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 we have to, to teach statistics or mathematics uh, to, to, to increase our uh, capacity of teaching of, of these things because it, apparently it's becoming uh, absolutely essential for, for, the, for the world to come. Uh, Jérôme, and, uh, uh, yes. Uh, sorry, no. Uh, I, I just wanted to, to ask, uh, actually Alejandro Mas is uh, asking, how, how is the experience of the three institutes, the three IEA institutes in France? Uh, is there some, is some experience that you could share or, or, or how can we cooperate with that center? But also in, in connection with, the, with what, what was previously discussed, I mean, how, how can these centers be helpful to interact with society and, and, and help uh, solving problems from, from real world in our countries? Uh, uh, so, so, so what they are trying, it's complex to, to my opinion, they, they, they are trying to match uh, well-established firms and uh, universities. Uh, you also have uh, founders like uh, Google or Facebook that are using, that are making their, their usual stuff. They put money everywhere. Uh, in all places, you have new interesting ideas, and they just grab all the ideas and increase again. So that's uh, that, that is uh, the, the idea behind the TensorFlow. Why TensorFlow is free? It's crazy. Uh, uh, 40 years ago, it would have been classified, but now they don't care. They just put it free. Everyone improves TensorFlow, and this is Google who is uh, using it. So, so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's difficult. It's just so, 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 so <laughs> not, as, you, as you see, I, 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 I'm not uh, uh, super optimistic. I, I, I think uh, we would need uh, uh, youth, both in research and in the industry. Uh, for instance, what I have observed is that uh, in, in Toulouse, uh, they, they don't like uh, taking risk and they, 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 they like uh, their routine and, and it's a problem. And I, and I have, when I meet my um, American fellows, I have the feeling that uh, there is, a, uh, this is an adventure of, uh, of young people who want to, to, to make new things take risks and so I think that one of the issues is there. Now, uh, as for the, the, the cooperation uh, between uh, France uh, and Chile, I guess that uh, what, what is uh, interesting, obviously, I think that Luis mentioned that, is uh, uh, student and uh, uh, co-tutel, co-direction, and uh, I think if this would be facilitated, uh, it would be a, a, good, uh, a good thing because we have a common um, mathematical culture and we have also a proximity in our uh, habits. So it's easy to work with Chile in French. And I guess- yes, but what, what you say is not specific to data. It's, uh, it's just to strengthen the, the, the relation between researchers. It's a more more general uh, solution, no? So I didn't understand, Jean Stefan. You, so what I say is that uh, what what you say about the, the students, the students is, is a good tool to strengthen the, the relationships between the researchers, but it's not specific to data. But no. but but do you think, uh, Jean Stefan, that there could be some specific? programs no uh, i don't know uh, i don't know for, for DBC, and, and not, not only for data in itself of course it, it would be important but also for the in, interdisciplinary uh training for, you know in in, in and yeah. also in, in in between france and chile because chile we have it's a natural laboratory for lots of things i'm not only astronomy we have lots of, of data of, of lots of fields and on the other hand uh well there is a lot of uh, there's a tradition of cooperation with with, with france in, in well in math in 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 computer science and topics where, where you can uh, develop uh, uh, tools to, to, to address, uh, to study new types of data. Uh, I don't know, there are lots of, I, there is a lot of potential, I, I, I think, to, to, for new things between Chile and France in this, uh, 
in this inter new interface. I don't know <laughs> if there's will be there would be some new opportunities. Uh, there is something a bit special in France. Uh, uh, some centers are attracting all the students. And for instance, in Paris, you, you have most uh, students. And now people in France have uh, so high level that they even make their PhD thesis uh, in the US or in Switzerland. And I think uh, for, uh, for me, who is, uh, for instance, in Toulouse, um, collaborating with, um, with uh, Ch Ch Chile is very interesting because in, in Chile, um, students are, uh, are very good. And, and I don't think we have this quality uh, in Toulouse. So I'm just speaking for myself. Uh, Hector, would you like to, to comment something? Yes, yes, not just to somehow complement what uh, what Guillaume uh, and Stefan say. Uh, yes, I think I think uh, most of the things we do, even if we have centers behind, uh, start from from the personal individual research and our activities. And somehow, a good starting point for a center collaboration is to to show to ourselves uh, our success. Uh, successful histories of uh, around data, right? Um, we have, for instance, a uh, good and very, uh, um, and very, let's say, with a high impact project in, in the public sector, private sector as well, the public sector, which maybe could be of interest for France or for Toulouse, the Pacific or Paris, of course. So, and, and, and on the opposite, and definitely uh, at least at CMM, uh, we always feel that uh, uh, we don't have enough uh, critical mass. So. Somehow, uh, somehow this kind of activities, joint seminar around a specific project, I don't know, to say something health and data, for instance, uh, but there are several uh, subjects like those, um, can, can be a good starting point to, to, to move forward and then proceed in the direction that, that, uh, that Jerome has, uh, let's say, uh, stressed, right? I mean, joint supervision of students, maybe joint programs, uh, of whatever postdoc or, or, or any other any other uh, activities like this, I mean, uh, and of course uh, among all those subjects, uh, also also there are there are space for for more fundamental uh, techniques, uh, fundamental tools applied to data. I think it's also important and is always in our in our uh, research, right? As, as as Jerome showed today, Clementine also this kind of subject. We we also work on methods, not only applications. So we have, we, we can maybe um, orient our work to, to some common activities that uh, permit to start some specific uh, path uh, of joint research. Thank you, Hector. Uh, so maybe to, to summarize, uh, I think a couple of ideas uh, have, been, have been mentioned, for instance, around organizing a, events or uh, activities where we can share our experience because there are, there are uh, lots of experiences both in Chile and France, of course, but also there are many, uh, there are um, uh, different experiences that are complementary and, and where some, someone can, could be looking for some solution and, and, and doesn't even know that there is somebody close or maybe not that close, but in France <laughs> uh, working on that, it would be interesting to collaborate. So so one, one good point would be to, to to establish some regular uh, um, event where we can share this, these experiences like this. And also, of course, the po point of, uh, of uh, um, educating uh, students and, and, to, and maybe taking be better advantage of, of what already exists. Uh, I mean, uh, towards something more inter interdisciplinary maybe. And uh, also in order that uh, the motivation, for instance, for, for a postdoc or for some PhD uh, somewhere in Chile or a Cotutel uh, could be uh, around these, these problems. I mean, uh, real problems from, from Chile or, or France where uh, data, data science tools are, and developments, new developments are needed. So, uh, well, I think this is, this is, and, all this uh, area brings uh, new new challenges, and and uh, also in, in particular in, in in how we can collaborate on them. 
and how we can collaborate in order not to be consumers, only consumers or, or uh, yeah, don't, don't, I mean, don't have the, the choice of what algorithms we, we use or, or uh, how we address a problem. And that, I think that's very important to think about that if from, as a, how to say, multilater multilaterally, I don't know if the word exists, but uh, I mean, I think we had lots of uh, common interests and, and, and pro progress, common progress that we can do uh, Chile, France, if we, if we put our capacities uh, in, this new, in these new questions and, and challenges. And uh, well, I hope this, this uh, workshop has, has gone into, in, in that direction and that we, we, we hope that we will be able to organize uh, events like this in the, in the near future, okay? So uh, I would like to, to thank all the participants, all the speakers of the session, and also all the participants on the, of, the, of the round table. And uh, yeah, and thank everybody for, for, for attending uh, this, uh, this session, okay? I don't know if somebody wants to <laughs> add something. No, thank you, thank you, Joaquin, to you for directing this uh, discussion, it was very, very nice. We will we will make it available soon. Uh, also, I, I mean the the of course the presentations, the the slides, but also uh, the videos of the of the of the session. Uh, well, we will let you know <laughs> where to find it. Okay. Okay. So, thank you very much, and uh, thank you. see you in some other occasion, hopefully. <laughs> Bye-bye, thank you. you Bye. Hopefully uh, not remotely. <laughs> See you. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.